Hello there. This video matches up with the spec point 3.7.1 inheritance and specifically the section on autosomal linkage. So in our last lesson, we looked at sex linkage and how genes can be specifically located on the sex chromosomes. But now we're looking at a different version called autosomal linkage. So what are autosomes first off? Well, they are the non-sex chromosomes that occur in our cells. And if a body cell has 46 chromosomes, and two of those are the sex chromosomes, that means that there are 44 chromosomes that are non-sex chromosomes. And that means 22 pairs. So let's take an example now. If we think of four chromosomes and they are in pairs so two of these from the mother and two of these from the father and they're in homologous pairs so one chromosome matching from the mother to the father and the other one they're doing the same and they have genes for specific characteristics we're going to label these genes A and B. We know that through normal inheritance, one of these should be dominant and one of them should be recessive. Now, what we're saying is that these genes are on separate chromosomes. So what we're describing these as are not linked. These genes are not linked. <clears throat> this means that if you were to do a cross of these genes we can get four possible outcomes we'll have capital a capital b we'll have lowercase a lowercase b we'll have lowercase a capital b and we'll have capital a lowercase b so four possible outcomes form these four non linked chromosomes and the ratio of getting all four outcomes is one to one to one to one so equal and this is how variation exists because during crossing over and during independent assortment these chromosomes can match up into a variety of different combinations however let's take an, a scenario where these genes are on the same chromosome. So we're saying now that A and B are on the exact same chromosome. This creates a different outcome. So if we were to take the gametes from these different chromosomes now, we can only get a certain combination. From our larger chromosome here, the combination we can get is only capital A, capital B. And from our smaller chromosome, it's lowercase a, lowercase b. So now we're describing these genes, A and B, as linked. Now, this scenario of genes being linked does exist in real life. And the best example of that is with an organism called Drosophila melanogaster. And this is the common fruit fly. So when you may have left some fruit, fruit out for too long, you'll probably see some flies that come around it eventually. And this is the fruit fly. And this fruit fly is not actually a model organism, meaning that it has genes which are very common and very similar to humans so it's studied in research now what genes are we interested in for the fruit fly we're looking at the body color and we're looking at the wing size so normally our body color for our fruit fly, fruit fly is gray so we're using capital G to denote dominant allele. 
However, the recessive allele, so lowercase g, would be for a black color. Whereas for our wing size, we have a normal wing size for a fluke fly, which we say capital N would be the notation. But the recessive allele will give something called a vestigial size or shape. And this means that it's not working, it's too short, so it has no function. So what we're going to do is, is perform a cross of two fruit flies and see what the outcomes are. So we're going to take a grey body, male and female, and we're going to take a normal sized wing for both. However, these flies are going to be heterozygous for both features. So that means that the genotypes for both of these parents are going to be capital G, lowercase g, capital N, lowercase n. So let's do a cross of these two parents now. However, let's look and see now what would happen and what would be our outcomes if the genes were linked. So now if the genes are linked that affects our gametes, we have capital G and capital N and lowercase g and lowercase n. Those are the only possible gametes that we can get because the genes are linked. So what will our offspring genotypes be now? Crossing them, we'll get one offspring which is completely homozygous dominant we'd get one offspring, which is completely homozygous recessive. But we'd get two offspring, which are heterozygous for both characteristics. But based on our phenotypes now, that should mean that we'll get three offspring, which are grey normal, and one offspring, which is black and vestigial. So that means that the ratio based on gene linkage here is three to one. Now, this scenario that we're going to use are if the genes are not linked. So they are not appearing on the same chromosome. If we were to do this now, this is supposed to be just like our normal dihybrid inheritance. So if we think back to that normal dihybrid inheritance, we came out with a ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to one, where nine of the offspring are dominant, one of the offspring is homozygous recessive for both features, and then you get two groups of offspring which are heterozygous for the features. So here is an exam question which I'd like you to try. So pause the video. Have a try of the question and then you'll see the answer afterwards. So our two parental phenotypes here are short white and long grey. So our, our genotypes for short white parent is lowercase h, lowercase g. And for long grey, it's going to be heterozygous for both characteristics. So let's look at the gametes that we can get from both of these parents now. For the short white, we can only get one combination, which is lowercase h and lowercase g. But for our long grey, because the genes are linked, this means that we only get two possible combinations capital H, capital G, and lowercase h, lowercase g. So dominant and recessive for both characteristics. So doing our cross now, 
we come out with one of the offspring being heterozygous for both conditions and one of the offspring being homozygous recessive for both conditions. That means that that first offspring is long gray and the second offspring is short white.